Hello, this is a CNN special, the year in review. I'm Lynn Russell. I'm Bob Kane. In the next 60 minutes, we'll look back at the top stories and newsmakers of 1986. We begin with the Challenger shuttle disaster, the worst accident in the history of space exploration. Good morning. This is shuttle launch control. The morning of January 28th, same routine. Here we see the uh, 51L crew enjoying breakfast. Mission specialist Dallison Onizuka sitting beside uh, teacher and space participant Krista McAuliffe. Commander Dick Scobie uh, sitting beside uh, pilot Mike Smith in front of the traditional cake featuring... Halley's Comet, and an apple for the teacher. Judy Resnick on the left, mission specialist, along with Ron McNair, and payload specialist, Greg Jarvis. After the traditional pre-launch breakfast, the shuttle crew walked confidently out to board the Challenger. Big smiles today. They suited up. The temperature is about uh, 24 degrees uh, on the pad. And then the countdown to tragedy. T-10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Engines throttling up, three engines out, 104%. Challenger, go with throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds, velocity 29 nautical miles, down range distance 7 nautical miles. we fall short, but we must pick ourselves up again and press on, despite the pain. President Reagan led the nation in tribute to the Challenger astronauts. A wreath was dropped over the spot where the Challenger supposedly fell, and the nation was plunged into mourning. Seven towns paid their last respects to seven astronauts but they weren't able to bury them until more than three months later when the astronauts' bodies were finally recovered from the sea and identified. I mean, they, they In the long investigation that followed the accident, the Presidential Commission uncovered a disturbing fact about how the astronauts died. A close examination of photographs and tapes showed the crew probably survived the initial explosion. The last recorded voice was pilot Michael Smith saying, uh-oh. The commission uncovered many other disturbing aspects to the shuttle disaster. The rocket manufacturers, for example, had tried to warn NASA about a problem with booster seals. In fact, I uh, made the direct statement that if anything happened to this launch, uh, I told them I sure wouldn't want to be the person that had to stand in front of a board of inquiry. It was only then that the public realized that the morning of January 28th was far from routine. Freezing temperatures had iced the launch pad. The O-ring seals holding the booster rockets together were defective. But worst of all, NASA apparently ignored all the warnings and decided to launch anyway. And an argument is always given that last time it worked. It's a kind of Russian roulette. NASA was in shambles. One by one, the officials who had presided over the Challenger accident were replaced. But the space program ran into technical difficulties as well, cursed with a series of launch failures. First, the Titan rocket, then the Delta. We have a main engine shutdown. Commercial concerns began looking to Europe, Japan, even China for alternative launch facilities. But the military had not lost interest in the shuttle. When the new shuttle launch schedule was unveiled in October, more than 40% of it was committed to Pentagon. 
Some non-military plans are still on the drawing board, like the space station to be completed in less than 10 years. It's expensive, it's ambitious, but it's part of a loftier goal, the exploration of space. The future does belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. The Challenger crew is pulling us into the future, and we'll continue to follow them. For the Year in Review, I'm Tom Mintier. In April, another terrifying technological accident, this one in the Soviet Union. An explosion and fire at a nuclear power plant near Kiev devastated the immediate area and sent radioactive clouds drifting halfway around the world. There was something ominous in the wind, and the first warning signs appeared in Sweden. Up to five times the normal level of radioactivity was detected over Scandinavia, carried there by winds from the Soviet Ukraine. Sweden and other countries asked Moscow what was going on and didn't get an answer for six hours. Finally, Radio Moscow admitted there had been a mishap at the Soviet Union's Chernobyl nuclear power plant. But there was no cause for alarm. In a terse statement, Moscow conceded that a reactor had been damaged and a few people injured, but insisted the government had the situation under control. Through satellite photos and other sources, the Western world soon realized the accident was far more serious than the Soviets were admitting. We know that uh, a major accident occurred at the Chernobyl uh, nuclear facility. We know that that uh, major accident resulted uh, in an explosion uh, and major damage uh, to Unit 4 at that facility. We know that a fire occurred and then we have a continuing fire at that facility. Within days, it was clear, and Moscow finally admitted, that the worst disaster more than 30 years of nuclear power had occurred at Chernobyl, about 80 miles north of Kiev. The Soviets originally reported two people had died, but the toll climbed rapidly to more than 30. Hundreds were hospitalized with radiation illnesses. More than 130,000 people were evacuated from the area. Plant workers labored to seal off the burning reactor before it could poison the water, the soil, and the air for hundreds of miles around. As the extent of the disaster dawned on Kremlin leaders, lines of communication to other nations opened up as never before. The Soviets showed pictures, held press conferences, invited foreign correspondents to the scene, called in nuclear experts from the United States and other countries. The fallout over other countries set off Geiger counters all around the world, even in the United States. The fallout was real, although it didn't amount to a serious danger outside the Ukraine, but it heated up the debate everywhere on whether nuclear power plants are worth the risk. The Soviet meltdown has made us ask this question. Can it happen here? Although the Chernobyl disaster, understandably, generates concerns about the safety of nuclear reactors, I want to state at the outset that we are confident in the safety systems and the operating procedures that DOE reactors have that have and have served us in the past and will continue to serve us extremely well. After desperate efforts, the Soviets finally sealed the damaged reactor permanently in concrete. Four months later, in an unusually frank and detailed report, they blamed the disaster on gross human error. Promising safer operation in the future, they repaired the damaged plant and began restarting the reactors that had been shut down during the crisis. They built new homes for the people returning to the area. But permanent damage had been done. The region around the Chernobyl plant will continue to be dangerous for years to come. Great tracts of farmland are useless, complicating the Soviet Union's persistent agricultural production problem. Over the next 70 years, up to 40,000 people in the Soviet Union may die of cancer as a result of the Chernobyl accident. Some Western experts say the Soviets continue to rely on obsolete and unsafe equipment at all their nuclear plants. They're afraid that this and not human error could cause more and worse nuclear disasters in the future. For the Year in Review, I'm Ralph Wengers. Just ahead on the Year in Review, the crisis that could diminish the Reagan presidency. And the tactics and targets of terrorism around the world. For President Reagan, a year that began with success and high hopes for the future is ending on a tarnished note. The disclosure of secret deals abroad sent the most popular administration in recent history into a tailspin. Two American hostages came back from Lebanon this year. Father Lawrence Martin Junko was released in July, not knowing why he was set free. But in November, shortly after David Jacobson came home, the world would learn what price the U.S. had paid. 
President Reagan sold weapons to Iran, and in the process, he sacrificed the credibility of his administration. We did not repeat, did not trade weapons or anything else for hostages, nor will we. At first, critics accused Reagan of giving in to terrorist blackmail. Then the story took a bizarre turn. Attorney General Edwin Meese revealed that some of the profits of the arms sale to Iran had been used to fund the Contra rebels in Nicaragua. And Meese said the entire operation was run by a relatively low-level member of the National Security Council, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North. And I don't think there is another person in America that wants to tell this story as much as I do, sir. But North did not tell his story. When Congress began looking into the scandal, North and his boss, Vice Admiral John Poindexter, took the Fifth Amendment. Other witnesses were more willing to talk, but they knew less about the whole affair. My role in that was zero. In closed hearings, CIA Director William Casey said he did not know much about it either. But before he was able to testify again, Casey was hospitalized with a brain tumor. White House Chief of Staff Donald Reagan and Attorney General Meese both said they believed the president had nothing to do with the Contra connection. But that did not necessarily let the president off the hook. The president has a, a dual problem. One, he doesn't have the information that everyone expects him to have. And uh, secondly, he needs it because uh, he needs to run this country. President Reagan fired North, accepted Poindexter's resignation, and appointed a three-man commission to investigate the National Security Council. He also called for an independent council to look into the affair. Former federal judge Lawrence Walsh was chosen for the job. Congressional leaders picked two select committees to conduct separate investigations. The president said he wanted everything out in the open, but opinion polls showed fewer and fewer Americans believed him. European allies did not know what to believe either despite the best efforts of the president's men to reassure them that American policies were firm. Of all the allies, only the Israelis were not surprised by the disclosure of arms shipments to Iran. That's because those shipments were funneled through Israel via a complex international network of private arms dealers, Swiss bank accounts, and retired American generals. And the ultimate beneficiaries were supposed to be the Contras. Until Congress voted to give them another $100 million this year, the Contras had to rely on other funds for their war against the Nicaraguan government. Those funds paid for operations like the plane that was shot down in October with a cargo of weapons for the rebels. Eugene Hassenfuss survived the crash. The Nicaraguans convicted Hassenfuss of terrorism, sentenced him to 30 years, then pardoned him and sent him home. Now there is another self-styled American mercenary in prison in Nicaragua, Sam Hall, brother of Ohio Congressman Tony Hall. The fly-by-night character of both the Hall and Hassenfuss operations have given Kong second thoughts about its support for America's not-so-secret war in Nicaragua. And now that Congress has found out the war was partly paid for by the sale of arms to Iran, the Contras may lose what little support they have left. For the Year in Review, I'm Susan Lasovich. While the White House was selling arms to Iran, it dealt much differently with other countries accused of sponsoring terrorism. Earlier in the year, the prime suspect was Libya, and the Reagan administration took a hard line. Libya was suspected in the airport massacres at Rome and Vienna one year ago. Twenty people died. Libya was suspected again in the bombing of a West Berlin discotheque in April. More than 200 people were injured, including more than 60 Americans. So when the U.S. decided to retaliate, Libya was the obvious target. In a nighttime raid that lasted only 11 minutes, American planes bombed military airfields, terrorist training bases, and the command post of Libya's leader, Muammar Gaddafi. He counted on America to be passive. He counted wrong. One American plane was lost in the raid. Pieces of it later washed ashore. Libya claims 40 people were killed in the raid. The victims were buried as martyrs. In Lebanon, four hostages were killed in retaliation for the American attack. One of them was an American, Peter Kilborn. The other three were British. Britain's Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher was the only European ally who openly supported the American raid on Libya. Still, other European countries joined Britain in kicking out Libyan students and diplomats suspected of involvement in terrorist activities. But Libya was not the only suspected sponsor of terrorism. Britain uncovered evidence that Syria was involved in a plot to blow up an El Al plane in London. Jordanian Nezar Hindawi was convicted of the crime. The Syrian ambassador was expelled, and Britain broke off relations. 
Not so long after that, Hindawi's brother was convicted of blowing up an office in West Berlin. Syria was accused of providing the explosives, and West Germany kicked out a number of Syrian diplomats. Other European countries were urged to take sanctions against Syria, but France, for one, was reluctant. Paris had been rocked by a series of bombings in September, and the French hoped Syria would help them put an end to the violence. Lebanese terrorists were suspected but never caught. Lebanese or Palestinian terrorists were also implicated in a number of other attacks around the world this year. In September, a Pan Am flight was hijacked in Pakistan. The ordeal came to a bloody end when Pakistani commandos stormed the plane. 21 people died in a storm of gunfire and grenades. A bomb ripped open the side of a TWA plane on its way to Athens. Four American passengers were sucked out of the plane and fell to their deaths. Arab gunmen stormed a synagogue in Istanbul and opened fire on the worshippers. 21 people were killed. Two Arabs threw grenades into a crowd near Jerusalem's Wailing Wall. 70 people were wounded. For that, and for other attacks on the Israelis during the year, Israel retaliated with several bombing raids on Palestinian bases in Lebanon. The Palestinians also came under attack this year from the Shiite Muslim militia in Lebanon. And it is from the rubble of those battered camps that sponsors of terrorism find many of their raw recruits. For the Year in Review, I'm Patrick Emery. Next on the Year in Review, a woman of courage and determination leads her country back to democracy. And the people of another nation struggle to set themselves free. This was a dramatic year of transition in the Philippines. A soft-spoken Filipino housewife emerged to lead a skillful revolution against a rich and powerful dictator. At the end of last year, Ferdinand Marcos was so confident of his power that he declared snap presidential elections. The opposition candidate was a long shot, Corazon Aquino, who described herself as just a housewife. But she was the widow of the Philippines' most popular opposition leader, Benigno Aquino. He had been assassinated in 1983, apparently by the Marcos government. Benigno's mourners became Corazon's supporters. She took the moral high ground during her campaign, and by the time it was over, she was drawing millions of people to her rallies. Marcos drew large crowds too, but his campaign had been hurt by rumors of ill health and charges of massive corruption. Still, Marcos predicted an easy victory, and indeed was declared the winner by the National Assembly. But international observers said the Marcos camp had bought votes and fixed the numbers. The Aquino camp set up its own vote counting operation, which declared her the winner. And Corazon called for a nationwide strike until Marcos stepped down. A military mutiny brought the standoff to a dramatic end. Marcos's defense minister and chief of staff seized control of the military headquarters in Manila and demanded that Marcos resign. I will not um, uh, resign. The president threatened to squash the rebellion by force. But his troops were blocked by an extraordinary display of what became known as people power. By the time Marcos was inaugurated, he didn't even have enough power to keep his ceremony on the air. Then, on a plane provided by the United States, he and his entourage fled to exile in Hawaii. A jubilant crowd burst into the presidential palace and saw for the first time the opulence of the Marcos family. After becoming president, Aquino quickly set about trying to get back billions of dollars that Marcos is accused of stealing from the country. She also moved to restore civil rights, releasing hundreds of political prisoners, including several leaders of the outlawed Communist Party. That was her first controversial move. Next, she dissolved the National Assembly and assumed legislative powers to make way for a new constitution and general elections next year. That move fueled the first of many protests against her government, protests that some said were orchestrated by ex-president Marcos. His former running mate tried and failed to proclaim himself president, but Aquino faced a far more serious challenge four months later from her defense minister, Juan Ponce Enrile. He demanded she take a tougher line against communism. Eventually, Aquino fired Enrile after discovering he planned a coup against her government. She reshuffled her cabinet and negotiated a ceasefire with the communist rebels. Aquino also won $200 million in aid from the United States, and more than three times that amount from Japan. So, in one year, Aquino led a peaceful revolution, 
quieted the communists and resisted a coup attempt. But she has yet to deal with the biggest problem she inherited from Marcos, an economy in shambles. For the Year in Review, I'm Christiane Amanpour. In South Africa, it was a year of discontent. Amid the unrest and the outrage, strict emergency powers became firmly entrenched. Fueled by the injustices of the apartheid system, rage burned in the black townships of South Africa. The violence took many forms. Bombings, beatings, even burials. Then fighting broke out between rival black groups in the Crossroads squatter camp. The government clamped down with a vengeance and declared a nationwide state of emergency. At least 8,000 people were arrested under the strict emergency regulations, many of them leaders of the opposition. But the unrest did not end. Only news of it did. The media were forbidden from reporting on the violence. The new security laws have accomplished what they set out to achieve. We simply don't know what's going on inside Soweto. And even if we did, we couldn't tell you. Bishop Desmond Tutu defied the government by calling for stronger international sanctions. Well, I just want to know what the world is waiting for. The world didn't wait much longer. The Commonwealth voted to impose sanctions against South Africa. Congress did, too, over the strong objections of President Reagan. We and our allies cannot dictate to the government of a sovereign nation, nor should we try. President Reagan vetoed the bill only to be overridden. Universities, cities, and states across America followed suit, divesting their holdings in companies doing business with South Africa. And many of those companies bowed to the public pressure. IBM and General Motors joined dozens of other American firms in selling out their interests in South Africa. The effect of the pullouts may only be psychological, though, since the operations will continue to run under new South African ownership. President P.W. Bota vowed not to be intimidated. We are not a nation of weaklings. We do not desire it, and we do not seek it. But if we are forced to go it alone, then so be it. The white minority government did make a few concessions to its critics over the year. It abolished the past laws that limited the movements of black South Africans and relaxed restrictions on black nationalist leader Winnie Mandela. For the first time in more than 20 years, she was allowed to return to her home in Soweto. But her husband, Nelson Mandela, remains in prison despite international appeals for his release. The appeals continued throughout the year. And so did the anti-apartheid demonstrations. Reminders to the South African government that the whole world is watching. For the Year in Review, I'm Chuck Roberts. When the Year in Review continues, East-West relations ice over in Reykjavik. And the splendor of a royal wedding captivates, thrills, and impresses. On New Year's Day 1986, President Reagan sent a televised message to the people of the Soviet Union. He told them he was looking forward to a visit later in the year from Soviet leader Gorbachev. It will be 1987 when President Reagan returns to the White House from his holiday vacation and Mr. Gorbachev has yet to come to Washington. Washington and Moscow spent much of the year in a propaganda war about when to hold a summit and what to talk about. President Reagan and Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev finally agreed on a preliminary October meeting in Reykjavik, Iceland. But instead of merely agreeing on an agenda, the two leaders opened intense and detailed negotiations on arms control. After about a day, they appeared on the verge of an unexpected and historic agreement on reducing offensive nuclear weapons. Then suddenly it all collapsed. Gorbachev vehemently objected to Reagan's space defense program, Star Wars. Reagan as strongly refused to put any limits on Star Wars testing and Will development. Reagan and Gorbachev parted coolly, each accusing the other of wrecking the negotiations. The surprise summit and its disappointing end followed a superpower dispute about spies. In August, a Soviet UN staff member, Gennady Zakharov, was arrested in New York and accused of buying U.S. defense secrets. In what was seen as retaliation, the Soviets arrested U.S. newsman Nicholas Danilov in Moscow and accused him of spying. The arrests upset efforts to set a date for the planned summit to be held in the United States. But Washington and Moscow worked out a deal. The Soviets released Danilov after about a month, and the U.S. freed Zakharov in what the White House insisted was not a swap. 
As part of that deal, Moscow also freed dissident scientist Yuri Orlov, who left with his wife to live in the United States. The new Soviet regime apparently was responding to increasing pressure for human rights. Earlier in the year, Moscow released Anatoly Sharansky, a leader of Jewish protest against Soviet oppression. And late in the year, dissident Nobel Prize winner Andrei Sakharov was allowed to return from exile to a teaching post in Moscow. But after Iceland, superpower relations remained in the deep freeze, with no new summit date in sight. The agreements made and then abandoned in Iceland left arms control progress in doubt and the rest of the world wondering what had gone wrong. For the Year in Review, I'm Brian Nelson. They wanted to awaken America to protest against nuclear weapons, so 1,400 activists started out from Los Angeles on the Great Peace March across America. Two weeks later, the march stalled for lack of funds, lack of support, and lack of planning. Many dropped out, but 400 diehards regrouped and continued their 3,600-mile trek across the country. It took eight months, but the marchers finally arrived to stage peace rallies and concerts in New York and the nation's capital. Revolution, death, and dissent changed the leadership of a number of foreign countries this year, but international headlines also included a royal wedding and a globe-trotting pope. Haiti's president for life is president no more. Jean-Claude Duvalier was forced into exile by a wave of popular discontent. The end of his 28-year rule was greeted with dancing in the streets. But angry mobs hunted down the members of Duvalier's dreaded secret police, the Tonton Makout. Henri Namfi, the commander of Duvalier's armed forces, formed a coalition to take over. They said we get a new government, but it's not really a new government. That's the same government we get. The new Haiti looks much like the old, with protests, strikes, and one of the world's poorest economies. Mozambique mourned the death of its popular Marxist president, Zamora Michel. Michel and several senior officials of his government died when their plane crashed just inside the South African border. Michel's supporters blame South Africa for his death. South Africa denies it. Michel was succeeded by his foreign minister, who was expected to pursue Mozambique's efforts to improve ties with the United States. Sweden's Prime Minister Olaf Palma, an ardent advocate of peace and disarmament, was gunned down by an assassin. For weeks afterward, mourners placed flowers on the spot where he was shot. A group with ties to the Bader Meinhof terrorists claimed responsibility for the assassination, but no suspect was found. Widespread strikes and violent demonstrations plagued the Chilean government for much of the year. There was even an unsuccessful assassination attempt on President Augusto Pinochet. But he survived to celebrate the 13th anniversary of the day he seized power. The government of Pakistan faced a challenge from opposition leader Benazir Bhutto. She is the daughter of a former prime minister who was executed by the current regime. Large crowds greeted Bhutto's return from self-imposed exile in Britain. Four months later, she was arrested for addressing a public rally. After her release from prison, Bhutto vowed to continue her campaign. Kurt Waldheim's campaign for the Austrian presidency was plagued by charges that he was involved in Nazi atrocities during World War II. His accusers said Waldheim took part in the brutal persecution of Jews and resistance fighters in Yugoslavia. But on the campaign slogan, a man trusted by the world, the former Secretary General of the United Nations easily won the elections. Waldheim later admitted he was involved in the Nazi crackdown in Yugoslavia as a supply officer. Elie Wiesel, a survivor of Nazi death camps, was awarded the 1986 Nobel Peace Prize. The noted author and human rights activist has devoted his life to making sure that the world never forgets the Holocaust. Among the major accidents around the world this year was a Mexicana Airlines crash in April. All 166 people on board were killed. More than 500 people drowned when an overloaded ferry boat capsized in Bangladesh. Nearly 400 passengers were dead or missing when their Soviet liner collided with a freighter in the Black Sea. A Soviet nuclear submarine sank in the Atlantic near Bermuda after an explosion killed three crewmen on board. The rest of the crew was safely evacuated before the submarine went under. U.S. officials said there was no danger of radioactive contamination of the ocean. A chemical spill on the Rhine River is spread like a blot on the European landscape. Some 30 tons of toxic chemicals were accidentally washed into the river when firemen tried to put out a warehouse blaze. Eels and fish died by the hundreds of thousands. The cleanup could take years. The leaders of Japan and the Western industrial nations were all smiles at the Tokyo summit. But when it was over, they had reached little agreement on how to solve the world's economic problems. Still, President Reagan called the meeting a triumph. 
He persuaded the members of the summit to take a united stand against terrorism. The Pope spread the gospel to the four corners of the world this year. His travels took him to Asia, Europe, South America, and Australia. And religious leaders from the four corners of the world came to the Pope. Together they prayed for a worldwide day of peace. And finally, another British royal couple tied the knot this year in a resplendent ceremony at Westminster Abbey, Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson exchanged vows. But the biggest cheers were reserved for the traditional balcony kiss. For the Year in Review, I'm Bobby Batista. More ahead on the Year in Review after this. Life is an opportunity, and, it, uh, and it's only limited. What you want to do and what you can achieve is only limited by what you can dream about. The farm pond's drying up, the creeks are drying up, wells drying up, everything's drying up. Pilots of a strange, spindly airplane called Voyager secured their place in history with a magnificent flying feat. Dick Rutan and Gina Yeager completed a nonstop journey around the world on one load of fuel. For nine days, they battled technical snafus, violent storms, and physical exhaustion in a cockpit the size of a pop tent. But they realized their dream after logging 25,000 miles. Well, I guess it was the last event in aviation, the last first that could ever be achieved. And it's a little more of a challenge than the normal records that we've gone after before. And to be able to do it was just something that we had to do. Life is an opportunity. And, it, uh, and it's only limited, what you want to do and what you can achieve is only limited by what you can dream about. And if you can conceive it, it, it's possible. President Reagan plans to honor the pilots tomorrow in Los Angeles, awarding citizens medals to Rutan, Jaeger, and Rutan's brother, Bert, the designer of the Voyager. Another Voyager soared into the headlines this year. The U.S. spacecraft Voyager 2 made an arduous journey into outer space, sending back startling close-up views of the planet Uranus. The spacecraft discovered new moons and rings and provided the first evidence of the planet's magnetic field. It took Voyager nearly a decade to approach the mysterious planet, about two billion miles from Earth, but it made more discoveries in a few hours than astronomers have been able to gather in the past two centuries. A devastating drought ravaged the American Southeast this year. In other parts of the world, nature's unpredictability produced even more deadly disasters. Out of the African night, without warning, the cloud of death rolled silently down through sleeping villages in northern Cameroon. Hundreds of people suffocated in their sleep. Entire families were wiped out. Miraculously, a few people managed to escape and warn the rest of the country. Scientists say it was poisonous gas from a volcanic lake probably released by a landslide or earthquake. More than 1,700 people died in the Cameroon death cloud, but the real toll may never be known because hundreds were buried without being counted. El Salvador, already plagued by civil war and a weak economy, was hit by a devastating earthquake that killed more than 1,000 people, injured 10,000, and left 200,000 homeless. Every government building in the capital city of San Salvador was in ruins or damaged. Hotels, hospitals, and homes were in shambles. Property loss alone in San Salvador was estimated at $2 billion. The South was hit by the worst drought in 100 years. The farm pond's drying up, creeks are drying up, wells drying up. Everything's drying up. Debt-ridden farmers faced economic ruin. Cattle and other livestock went without food and water. Midwestern farmers organized massive hay lifts that helped save livestock and win friends. We want to call them the good old boys. And you know, that's a southern saying, but we have to classify them Illinois people as good old boys. While the southeast shriveled under a merciless sun, the west and midwest had to battle to stay above water. Torrential downpours inundated west coast states. And later in the year, heavy rains caused hundreds of millions of dollars in damage to Midwestern states from Michigan to Oklahoma. Thousands were forced from their homes, and Michigan alone reported $300 million in property and crop damage. Volcanoes erupted in Japan and Hawaii, putting on spectacular visual displays. On the Japanese island of Oshima, 11,000 people were swiftly evacuated when Mount Mahara erupted for the first time in 12 years. 
Like a gigantic cauldron, Hawaii's Mount Kilauea bubbled over with molten lava, sending fiery rivers surging to the sea. Scores of homes were consumed as the lava burned through forest to build a black beach where it touched the ocean. But again, people in the path of the molten lava were evacuated safely. Alaska's Hubbard Glacier pushed across Russell Fjord and created an instant inland lake 40 miles long. It also created an instant trap for hundreds of porpoises and seals. For weeks, the fate of the animals was in doubt. But finally, nature relented. The 300-foot ice dam broke up, and the porpoises and seals made it out on their own. For the Year in Review, I'm Pat Etheridge. The Year in Review will continue with a look back at Hands Across America. And the biggest, brightest 4th of July ever. In May, more than five million Americans joined hands in a human chain that virtually stretched across the country. The event was organized to shine a national spotlight on the problems of poverty and homelessness. The chain spanned more than 4,000 miles, from the wharf of the Queen Mary in Long Beach, California, to Battery Park in New York City. The project raised between 15 and 20 million dollars for the poor, and the first contributions went out to charities in time for Thanksgiving. America threw a double birthday bash on the 4th of July, a celebration of its own independence, and the Statue of Liberty's first 100 years. Dear Liberty, had a great time at your birthday party. resplendent, your new torch beaming a welcome over the harbor. For a century, you greeted the tired, the poor, and the huddled masses yearning to breathe free, made a lot of friends that way, and a lot of new American citizens. Naval guns saluted the president as he reviewed the lineup of warships from all over the world. Overhead, a patriotic aerial salute. And down the river, the parade everyone was waiting for the slow and regal procession of stately ships. Leading the armada was the Coast Guard's bark, Eagle, with a copy of the Declaration of Independence on board. In its wake followed the largest gathering of sail ever seen in this century, an armada of tall ships, slipping quietly past you one by one, like ghosts of the era when you were born. The harbor was fairly jammed with a flotilla of fans, tens of thousands of boats bobbing at your feet and at least a million landlubbers packing the shoreline. It's going to be great. That's the weather, the people. We saw the president. We saw Some Lady Liberty. Look at yeah. <laughs> The best time ever. Six dollars. And everywhere, the souvenirs. But such is the price of fame. Liberty, on the other hand, is priceless. Tonight, with heart and hand, through whatever trial and travail, we pledge ourselves to each other and to the cause of human freedom, the cause that has given light to this land and hope to the world. So thanks again, Liberty, for a good time and happy birthday. And so we come to the close of another program and another year. We wish you health and happiness in 1987. I'm Lynn Russell. 
and I'm Bob Kane. We leave you with a look at some of the faces of 1986. A few of the people who have made news or made a difference in our lives. These have been the best 15 years of my life. I took it for years, but I don't have to take it anymore. And in every thought, I own the heart at least one lovely girl. You see, this old man still has a little magic left in him. <laughs> oh, they just fired Big Chicken. <laughs> God, I don't know how I do it. And I am just so, so happy to be here. No, I'm right. I don't be so silly. There she is, Miss America. I, Clint Eastwood. Do you solemnly swear? Do you solemnly swear? I got the job. I'll always be a man of the House of Representatives. I'm not, you know, pure as a driven snow.